Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's School Board Candidate Forum. Let me start by thanking the sponsors who made this event possible, and they are the Fairfield Area Chamber of Commerce, Fairfield Economic Development Association, and the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center. And I, Andy Hallman, will be your moderator this evening. On the stage are four candidates vying for a seat on the Fairfield Community School District's Board of Directors. The candidates are Jennifer Anderson, Ben Picard, Michael Lane, and Ryan Kirka. They are competing to fill a seat vacated by former board member Phil Miller, who resigned from his position in August after winning election to the Iowa House of Representatives. The election to fill the school board seat will be this coming Tuesday, October 17th, the winner will complete the final two years of Miller's term. Early voting is already underway at the courthouse, which is open from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And polls on election day will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the current members of the school board, several of them having just won election to the board last month, the four newest members are Frank Bros, Debbie Plum, Kelly Scott, and Christy Welsh. They join Paul Miller and Board President Warren Schaefer. Tonight's forum will proceed as follows. The candidates will take turns answering the same question. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer. Timekeepers in the front will alert the candidates when they have 15 seconds remaining and when they have five. Each candidate will have two minutes for a closing statement. The organizers of tonight's event have prepared four questions to ask the candidates, and we ask you, the audience, to supply the fifth. Chamber and FIDA representatives have pens and paper for you to submit a question. We will review them and pick the best one. So if you have not turned in your question, please uh, do so as soon as possible. And without further ado, let's begin with question one. And uh, Ben Picard will be answering first. Serving on a school board carries the responsibility of working as a team and being a steward of taxpayer dollars. First, give examples demonstrating the type of team member you are, and second, Share your experience and knowledge of responsibly administering public dollars. Great. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, uh, everyone who's joining tonight and supporting public education. Sincerely appreciated. Um, so regarding what kind of team member I am, um, I really um, get right there in the trenches and the, the nitty gritty in solving uh, a lot of the minutia and the details um, uh, and have for a number of years throughout my first um, career in corporate America, um, where I scaled the corporate ladder to uh, vice president. Um, and then subsequently, uh, my, my career has been just going to smaller and smaller companies, those that I've founded and um, successfully grown. And in doing so, really, I was always in the position of sales, whether it was recruiting new employees, whether um, it was um, gaining new customers, whether it was out attracting venture capital um, and such, and really had to take um, a couple of levels. Um, and 15 seconds, so, so basically, uh, let's answer the second one. I don't have um, experience with um, administering public dollars, but I've run multi-million dollar All right. budgets. And thank you very much, thank Ben. You. Uh, as far as being a team player, I have served on different boards. They each uh, require team players if you're going to be an effective board member. I've also done this on the school board. And being a true team player can show its true colors when you get on a board that has uh, diverse members and diverse opinions on 
the topics that you have to resolve. So I believe I can come to a consensus. And it also, the strength of the board is shown by how strong your team is. So I think it is imperative to be a team player and when you're doing that on a school board, it's a key factor. As far as the tax dollars, yes, you only get so much. Um, and your, your wants are much higher than, and needs are much higher usually than what we get as tax dollars. Therefore, you, you know your set amount. You know that you can't go to the taxpayers and continue to increase your tax dollars, which is something that we have strived for and done very well. But you have to diverse, or diversify your spending according to what your incomes are when that's fixed. And you want to make it as equitable as possible as you can for the students and for the service that we provide, which is education. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And Ryan Kirka, same question. Ryan, would you like the question repeated? I think I got it. You got it, okay. Um, as for what type of team member I am, uh, I had spent 15 years on the Fairfield Fire Department. Um, within that, everything is a team activity. Um, you always go in, two in, two out. Everything is done as a team. You work together to try and solve all of the problems that face you. Um, along the lines of public spending dollars, um, I did not deal a lot with the budget of the fire department, um, but my current position, um, I'm required to keep track of all the money that I have spent out and also to track what others are spending and how the claim aspect works for them. Um, All right, thank you, Ryan. And uh, last, Michael Lane. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as far as my experience being on a team, um, I would say basically every job that I've had in one way or another revolves around teamwork. Initially, starting out in the military, uh, I work in a hospital, so in the medical field, Obviously, you're uh, constant rel constantly relying on different functional areas and communicating with one another to ensure the best possible care. After that, uh, most of my work, work experience was focused on construction and building houses or remodeling, and same kind of thing there. Um, you, you always have to be working together in that aspect. And currently working at John Deere, the majority of my experience was in operations, manufacturing, obviously, where I was in charge of a team. And so uh, that experience is more along the leadership role, but getting everyone to understand that it's vital to work together. And without doing that, you're not going to achieve the levels that you could have. As far as what was it being a steward of taxpayer dollars? Uh, yes, share your knowledge of responsibly administering public dollars. I don't think I have experience in that, if you want me to be completely honest. I have, <laughs> it's a really specific question, thank you. Um, All right. But I, I've, I have experience with budgets at work, uh, but as All far right. as... Uh, thank you very much, Michael. You. Share your personal experiences and connections with the Fairfield Community School District, and we will start with Jennifer Anderson. I have a, a few connections over the years with um, serving on the school board. It actually started that way, that I served and um, began uh, from 93 to 99. Then my experience, well actually it was before that because I am a high school graduate from here and went through um, grade school and all of my undergrad years here. Then uh, I started on the school board, then I took um, 10 years out when my kids got to the age that they wanted, it was more important that I was home with them. Then I got to experience it as, as a parent. Then when my children got to uh, middle school and high school age, I wanted again to try for the school board and have the um, experience of serving on the board. I have done that, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I find a lot of value in trying to serve the public in a capacity that I can give back as much as possible. 
And I think that this is it because I have a depth of knowledge and totally respect the public education system and want to continue to see it thrive as much as we possibly can for our community. Thank you. And Ryan Kirka, share your experience and connections with the Fairfield Community School District. Well, like Jennifer, I did go to school here. I graduated from Fairfield High School. Um, once my kids were born and they got into school, they both go to uh, Fairfield Community School District. Uh, my wife is big on the PTO group for the elementaries, and <laughs> I have been looped into many, many projects with them um, from setting up things, making things for their carnivals, putting screens up for their movie nights, uh, fixing their equipment on there. Um, I've also, uh, through my my involvement in the Elks Lodge have helped out at different events for the school from Red Ribbon Week, um, parking cars at uh, prom time, um, helping uh, with the junior class race funds here two years ago. Um, also, uh, both of my children dragged me into a number of things of going to their different events that they have and uh, programs of music programs and that also. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan. And Michael Lane, share your personal experiences and connections with the Fairfield Community School District. So my experience with the Fairfield School District started in first grade and is ongoing today. Um, had a brief stint where I went to Van Buren and then came back. It wasn't my choice though. Anyway, uh, so, I can tell you with my upbringing, I did face some challenges and, and the experience that I had with the Fairfield School District was always so positive and it takes me, the first thought that comes to my mind is uh, honest Dave Messerly and I wrestled and, and just the, the support that, that I was given here has probably led a lot to where I'm at today, which easily could have gone a different direction. So I've had nothing but positive experiences. I tried to drop Dave Messerly's anatomy class when I was a senior and he wouldn't let me. And I ended up getting an A. And then I became an LPN and all that anatomy uh, information helped me a great deal. So I was always thankful for that and thankful for the uh, teachers involved in helping me. Now I have two children in the district in fourth and sixth grade, and they absolutely love it. I'm fortunate enough to work for a company that is global and spread out across the country, and I've had opportunities to leave, and I choose not to, and I don't think they would let me leave if I wanted to, but we're here because we want to be here. All right, thank you very much, Michael. And Ben Picard, share your personal experiences and connections to the district. Great, thank you. So, um, actually, first connection with my family and um, education in the area was um, back in 1876, my great, 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 great um, grandfather, William, actually donated part of his family farm to found Pleasant Plain Academy that ran for 40 years, grew to around um, 70 students, and then ultimately was displaced by um, the consolidated schools and um, the district itself. And my grandmother, Mabel, um, she was a teacher at Pleasant Plain. Um, and then my mother, Eileen, she was a school cook for the district for 18 years before retiring. And she was also awarded the first Friend of Public Education Award, um, the first year that was um, awarded um, under Marilyn Green, the uh, art teacher that she was helping out. Um, myself, I graduated in 1998 from the high school and graduated top of my class and was the senior class president and cross country co-captain. Um, taught me some really good leadership skills at the time. And I've got my own Messerly story, although it was Ralph Messerly who actually pulled me um, in for like a, a case study um, during my senior year. And so I got out of class and he, he did a class on me. Thank you, Ben. 
And just a reminder, the candidates will have three minutes to answer these questions and then two minutes at the end for closing remarks. So moving on to the third question. We all know that the shortage of state funding is a huge challenge for Iowa's public schools. However, there continue to be many opportunities. This is a two-part question. Aside from state funding, what do you see as the greatest challenges facing public K through 12 education today and in the future? Secondly, what do you see as the greatest opportunities facing public K through 12 education today? And we will start with Michael Lane. So one of, one of the greatest challenges, I've got several, this is a hard one in three minutes, but um, one of the biggest ones is poverty. There's a high number of students in our district, they get free or discounted lunches, which show that obviously we have an issue with poverty in our community and there's a strong correlation between poverty levels and lower levels of achievement. Uh, another issue or challenge that we're facing is increased student to teacher ratio. Technology continues to be a big issue which is exacerbated by a lack of funding um, and technology specifically is difficult in two different aspects. One, having the funding to prepare students for college, for the workforce with ever-changing technology is difficult, but also on the flip side has created a generation of people tied to their cell phone, tied to Facebook, and uh, just a general change in the behavior and, and students. And probably one of the most important ones is just the widening uh, political and ideological gap that's growing in the country and even in the community. Uh, you saw this in the first election. It was almost immediately us versus them. There was a divide and that was very disappointing to me because it turned what's supposed to be a bipartisan public office very quickly turned into a political campaign instead of uh, focusing on the students and, and reach, being able to reach their highest level of achievement. And each of these challenges is an opportunity in and of itself. You can combat poverty and the effects that that has by teaching parents, making sure that they know and understand that they have to read to their children. This, this can't all be put on teachers. Education starts in the home. Uh, decreasing enrollment, also a very difficult one to challenge. Technology with the way state funding is, you have to think outside the box. You have to have fundraisers. Um, ask for donations, you have to do different things like that. Um, and then somehow we have to get rid of the us versus them mentality and find a way to work together regardless of what your political views are. That's the only way we're going to come up with the best solutions to the issues. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Ben Picard, uh, aside from state funding, what do you see as the greatest challenges facing public K through 12 education? And what do you see as its greatest opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the greatest challenge facing Iowa public education in general um, is really uh, around the concept of conformity. What we've inherited is an industrialized, standardized, test-based model of education, and I believe that it's sapping some of the creativity um, out of our students and perhaps even um, uh, binding the hands of our teachers. And I believe that creativity is just as important as literacy in education, but our system really isn't set up to nurture it. Now, a second challenge is that our system is set up with a certain linearity towards a preferred outcome, and that's getting the kid into college. So basically, you go through the track, and then you arrive at the pinnacle of K through 12 educational success by getting into college, but not every student goes to college, nor, nor should they be expected to. And the third challenge is really cultural, um, and it's that our concept of intelligence is tied to academic ability. And the consequence of that is that many highly talented, brilliant students 
Um, they think they're not because um, traits like being a little bit too creative or the inability to sit still are stigmatized and even labeled as part of any number of learning disorders these days. So the opportunity for Iowa public education is to evolve from this industrialized manufacturing model of public education to really a personalized learning model based on the principles of agriculture, which we know well around here. Discovering early and then growing a kid's natural talents in a field in which they can thrive. And we need to let our teachers develop their own innovative approaches and personalized student curriculums and, and really encourage that. In our community, there are a number of people who represent some extraordinary resources in business, in multimedia, in internet, in mobile devices. And these technologies combined with these extraordinary talents of our teachers really provide an awesome opportunity to revolutionize, personalize, and scale local public education. And I'm really encouraged to see so many members of the community um, here tonight to get involved. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ben. And uh, Jennifer, do you need the question repeated? You got it. Some of the greatest challenges for um, public education, K-12, um, at all for all the nation is the diversity of the preparation of the kids when they present themselves to school. That diversity can hinder or make a difference in that student all the way on. A lot of that could be another a challenge would be the variety of languages that the students speak or have in their environment at home. Also, the family unit has changed a lot or it is non-existent. And this can hinder the performance of the students at every single age level. Some of them even end up um, supporting the parents or the senior figure, figures in their household. This can go on to, of course, the level of poverty that is present. And then another factor is that you get into the different districts and all of those factors are compounded because it's, it's the demographics of each district or each building within each district that makes a difference. All of that has to be tied in together to have the teachers give the best possible education in every classroom for every single student. And that goes back to the evaluation tools or the mindset that Ben alluded to that we have to put numbers on them when sometimes numbers aren't the best way to measure things. But that is the standard that we have to get along with. Another um, difficulty or challenge is meeting the needs of all of the different, um, different impairments that students present or are with each student as they come. And then to put them all in one classroom with the diversity of each student. I think another challenge is keeping uh, quality teachers and administrators. They're a key in delivering our product, the education, and we, they are, that is a great challenge. It is also a great opportunity because there are terrific teachers and administrators out there that thoroughly love their job and live and breathe it every day and make a huge impact on those students for life. Um, another challenge is engaging the students. It's just like employees. You have to engage them constantly to make the performance and for them to excel in what they're doing. Technology is also a huge opportunity for education and the students and the teachers. So it can tie many things together. All right, together. thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. And we will move on to Ryan Kirka. Ryan, would you like the question repeated? Sure. Okay. Aside from state funding, what do you see as the greatest challenges facing public K through 12 education today and in the future? Secondly, what do you see as the greatest opportunities facing public K through 12 education? 
Well, I can see it's not good to go last on this question. Uh, these three have presented some very good things, and mine are not much different. I do feel that uh, the curriculum is a major thing, um, not only providing for the children with the IEP, but also getting a, a higher level for those at the opposite end of the spectrum to get them engaged and challenging themselves through college credit classes and that. But there's also those middle of the road people that uh, see it as maybe college isn't their thing. Um, providing something in there of an educational uh, value, such as a, a vocational school or something like that, to allow for them to have somewhere to go. Um, not everybody goes to college. Um, many times it doesn't always fit in with them, but everyone needs skilled training. Um, everywhere now is hiring for those skilled people and that's a major void that we need to fill. Um, one of the biggest opportunities I think is through this technology. Um, at one of the school board meetings I've seen that uh, the school district now has some virtual reality glasses. This provides uh, the students uh, fully interactive um, with their lesson. They are engrossed inside of these different places I believe on that. Um, this is one that keys on there. Also are partnering with uh, Indian Hills and some others to provide the college classes that some of these children are needing um, are just key to everything that we need to move forward in and try to not just hit the top level or the bottom level, but also hit those in between that they're just not sure what they want to do. They're ready to graduate from high school and they don't know where to go, at, but they think they enjoy this. Gives them an opportunity to go towards something. Um, you know, maybe they have a fascination with cars and want to work on cars. That is an opportunity for us to teach them in a middle level where maybe they're not going to college, but they're not working at McDonald's or just in between. All right, thank you, Ryan. And take a sip of water because you're the next one up for this question. Okay. Public boards face making difficult decisions because popular opinion may not fall in line with the decision. Tell us about a time you were faced with making a decision that was not considered popular, but that you felt was right. Um, unfortunately, uh, my job is pretty much that anymore. Um, I am an insurance adjuster, which kind of requires me to give a lot of bad news and good news um, you're making tough decisions at all times within that. Um, tough decisions are just part of the job, unfortunately. Um, for several years, I was an EMT here in town, and you always make tough calls on those. Um, it is not something you take lightly, but sometimes you have to make the call for the better of the large majority, even though you hear a lot more from the smaller majority as to what's best. Um, decisions made, um, I feel strongly that you shouldn't take them lightly, but you must stand behind your decision on there. It's not something that you can waver back on because, oh, this person made a, a good argument, maybe we should reconsider, but sometimes those decisions are made for a reason. Um, not everybody knows all the reasons, but we need to make them and stand behind them and move forward to make everything work. All right, thank you. And next is Michael Lane. Uh, Michael, tell us about a time that you had to make an unpopular decision. This is really difficult for me to narrow down to one. Um, similar to Ryan, I don't have a highly sought after job by a lot of people. Um, like I said previously, I'm the labor, labor relations administrator at John Deere and Atumwa, which means I'm responsible for administering the labor agreement. I, I deal with every single grievance filed by the union members, as well as all the discipline beyond the first step to include termination. So um, yeah, narrowing this down to one is fairly difficult. Uh, one in recent memory, we had a gentleman reach the point of termination and you know obviously the the union fights pretty hard for people like that and um, his issue had to was dealing with absenteeism and he 
reached the final step and though they were passionate for this employee and though they tried to give all sorts of arguments and concoct quite a story as to why he was late yet again, um, I made the decision to go ahead and terminate even though uh, you know the union would try to say that this is going to hurt employee engagement and this is going to do this and that. And you kind of have to think of the greater good for the company at that point and, and frankly for the rest of the workforce and stand by your decision because if nothing else you have to be consistent with the way that you treat people and the policy was the policy and that was the point that he reached so that was the decision that I made and stood by it and would do it again. All right, thank you, Mile. And Ben Picard, tell us about a time you had to make an unpopular decision. Yeah, it really goes back to um, the, the first part of my uh, corporate career. And um, basically, we, we were looking to restructure our company, um, a billion dollar uh, manufacturer and retailer, and um, got a core team together and for three weeks we were in the Ramada Inn in um, Warwick, New Jersey, um, just crunching numbers and running a lot of linear optimizations and such. And, you know, I'm just thinking these are real people that are being fired um, from this model. Um, and, all, and ultimately, Ultimately, the model was right, and we went through every single possible scenario to keep as many people employed as we possibly could. Um, but then we ended up closing five plants and seven distribution centers, but then opening some others, you know, super plants, super distribution centers, and trying to hire some of these employees back um, into uh, this system. And what we um, ultimately found was you know, success in growing the company uh, from $30 million in profit to 75, uh, I'm sorry, 175 million over the course of six years. And then um, quite ethically, I believe, delivered it into the hands of Warren Buffett, um, who buys companies like you know age-old brands um, and such, and then leaves the management to run it um, and doesn't really uh, look to restructure uh, and such. And we had higher offers than um, Warren Buffett gave, but decided that that was really uh, the right thing to do for the employees. Um, and um, since then, the company has been thriving. All right, thank you, Ben. And Jennifer, tell us about a time you had to make an unpopular decision. I'm not gonna touch any of the unpopular decisions I made on the school board, or at least to some. <laughs> because that's, that, I, I want, don't want to touch that. I'm going to go back to when I was uh, the laboratory manager at Henry County Health Center. And at that time, um, the laboratory was a money generator for the bottom line of the hospital. And uh, we, we had a very large dialysis unit, and this was way ahead of when it branched off and came over here. Um, the uh, Chemistry analyzing and the blood work results are very critical to each of those dialysis patients every single time they're in there. They wanted to, um, they had to choose between farming it out or keeping it in-house. And um, I obviously wanted to keep it in-house. I had to prove that it was the right thing to do and for the bottom dollar. They wanted me to go ahead and pretty much go along with the um, outspoken dialysis unit manager who had a little bit different motive than what the hospital did, or their ultimate goal was. I chose to do it silently and to prove it by data and performance when others wanted me to speak out loudly and get in people's face. And ultimately, it tied together the unity and the teamwork of about three different departments in the hospital 
rather than to make a great big bold statement. And in the long run, it was the best thing to do, and I'm glad I did, and um, my employees certainly appreciated it, and we got to add more employees. So, let's go. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And we have received a number of questions from you in the audience, and it's a pity that we don't have time for only one. Um, beginning the fifth question will be Ben Picard, and the question is, who are your heroes and inspirations? Who are my heroes and inspirations? Well, um, I've already mentioned Ralph Messerly. Um, he, he um, during those sessions, um, basically I was in kind of a, a, a funk, uh, and um, I wasn't doing the greatest in my classes. I mean, I almost let my four point slip. Um, and such, and he gave me uh, a piece of advice that um, I really carry forth to this day. And you know, as part of his class, um, you know, he did some research and said, "Okay, I've done some research, and the way you get out of a funk is you redouble your efforts." Um, it sounds like paradoxical um, and such but give it a try. And so then in Mrs. Bradley's chemistry class, which I was getting basically a C or a D um, in, I doubled down and um, ended up, uh, and the final was graded on a curve, and I got like 200% or something obscene um, because I had just really focused on it. So, um, you know, I've thought about that through the years. But then, like in my corporate career, um, probably someone more like um, Michael Porter, and really thought about as the father of strategy. Um, and I think that, um, you know, a long-term strategy is very important in all initiatives and all businesses and such in the Fairfield and public school system to really be able to look out there um, several years and see what the market is going to be like and how can we be competitive and um, and turn out an ever-growing crop of of brilliant students with very good skills in life and especially versus our neighbors um, right now we're um, we're struggling a little bit uh, versus some of our neighbors to the west and even neighbor to the east um, districts in terms of some of our scores and all but I think that we can really um, strategically look at this um, transform uh, redesign uh, some of our approaches and get back on track but we're going to do it through strategy thank you all right thank you Ben and Jennifer who are your heroes and inspirations I've never dwelled on who's been my hero too much so this has made me think a lot um, I would go back to uh, I had this outstanding college professor, Dr. Dolores Graff. She's actually, I think, a, uh, no, she was a Lockridge High School graduate. Uh, the woman was brilliant. Um, she is probably five foot tall. She would get down and dirty in nature to the max, appreciated um, all of the creation. She was a life, is a lifelong learner, and I learned that early on. She also helped me to realize that what you do is you find your own interests and if you are truly interested in something you will excel. There's just no doubt about it. My parents are my heroes and my inspirations. Um, they were married a long time. Uh, my dad was a World War II, is a World War II vet. Uh, my mom stayed home and waited for him um, patiently I think. They um, lost one of their daughters um, at an early age, and they actually came through it with a lot of bruises, but they came through it. I had an aunt that um, was never able to have kids, and so somehow she accepted me under her wing, and uh, was she took nothing off of anyone, and yet was gracious with everyone. I learned a lot that way. I find inspiration from um, art, wisdom, many things in life. There aren't too many things that don't inspire me. I find inspiration from um, one of my son's friends who uh, has been disabled since birth 
and finds joy in every single thing there is in life. And they inspire me to continue to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Ryan, who are your heroes and inspirations? Well, like Jennifer, I had to dwell on this a little bit. And I, I think of a quote that I had seen on there. Um, it goes, if you have the option to be yourself or be Batman, be Batman. You may not be the person that everybody likes, not the person everybody thinks they want, but in the end, you are the person that they need. Someone in there giving them the grounding, being the person that does the dirty work, that takes the brunt of it, and you move forward. That is why I would be Batman. All right, thank you, Ryan. And Michael, who are your heroes and inspirations? Unlike Jennifer and Ryan, this immediately came to me because I've talked about it with anyone that knows me, and it is Dan Gable. Um, if you do not know who Dan Gable is, first of all, shame on you. <laughs> Second of all, I'll tell you a little bit about Dan Gable. So Dan Gable, in my opinion, in most people's opinions, is probably the best uh, collegiate wrestler ever, probably. Uh, anyway, so Dan Gable won every match all the way through high school and all the way through college until his last match um, in the national finals. His senior year was the first time he was defeated. And through that devastation, he stood on the podium in second place, tears streaming down his face, just completely devastated. But what he did the next day is what was most inspirational to me. He got out of bed and started training for the Olympics. He didn't dwell on it. It was a loss. It probably still hurts him, but he still got up and did what was right and started training. And through that, he ended up in the Olympics, became an Olympic champion um, while being injured, didn't give up any points. Pretty amazing story. Uh, the more amazing part was the fact that he was an even better coach, better leader, uh, a better example than he ever was a wrestler. He had the ability to cater to whatever. Some wrestlers need slapped in the face before they wrestle. Some need something inspirational whispered in their in their ear excuse me in their ear and dan gable just had a way of getting the best out of every single wrestler and i think a lot of us you know teachers administrators included could use some of that and and understand you know uh, teaching isn't a one-size-fits-all thing and and this guy dan gable was a perfect example of that and I've always looked up to him and had the amazing opportunity of meeting him here and talking to him. And he's just, he's always been my hero and my inspiration. All right. Thank you, Michael. We will now move into closing arguments. The candidates will have two minutes each. We will begin with Jennifer Anderson. I guess I don't have any uh, closing arguments, but I do want to say that I have a goal, and that's why I have chosen to run again for the school board. And that's truly to make this the very best district that we possibly can in our area, in our state, period. I firmly believe in public education. I believe it's the foundation of our culture, and it's certainly a foundation of our community here. We all want this community to thrive. We're invested in it. We want to see it move forward. To do that, we need the, a strong school system, and that will help everything else perpetuate to be stronger. It has to be strong for every single student that is in the classroom. It, it can't be just a select few. It has to be for all. And truly, that's what society is once you get out of the educational world. I feel that I have some skill sets that I can bring to the table. I have served before, and I've got a depth of knowledge that I can continue to bring and um, help to further this district to be better. I think I can make a difference in that manner. I think I bring diversity to the current board. 
I think that's important. I'm open-minded. Um, I do my research. I do listen. I do invite change when it's going to make a difference. I'm willing to try a lot. I am a team player, and I'm pretty fair. I'm also patient. And I've been um, dedicated to serve this district, and I would really appreciate the opportunity to do it some more. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Ryan Kirka. <clears throat> my devotion uh, for the city of Fairfield has been going on most of my adult life. Um, I do see that by joining in and becoming part of all these things that you do incite the change. Um, I gave 15 years on the Fairfield Fire Department. I do volunteer with the PTOs. In fact, most of the people in the building seem to know me because they just say hi every time I'm in there. Um, I have devoted a lot of time, not only with my children being there, but to get to know the people, to be involved with all the aspects of it. Um, I feel that I would be a great asset to add, not only through the fact that I do have different ideas than most. I don't, I'm, I'm pretty outspoken. I say what I mean, I mean what I say. Um, I don't make promises to people if I don't feel I can keep them. Um, over the long term, I think that's what we need. Um, we don't need a lot of smoke and mirrors on things. We just need to be straightforward and say why on there. Um, with that, I thank all my support that I have. Thank all of you for coming. And thank you, Ryan. Uh, Michael Lane. What I would like people to know is that um, I am open-minded and very level-headed through the job that I have and, and really all my experiences. I've learned to uh, be able to control my emotions and make decisions um, clearly and concisely. I don't have any preconceived notions about the board. I don't have a political agenda of any kind. I, I really just want people to know that my number one focus is the students of the district. Um, I'm not the type of person to just follow along with the group just because that's the popular thing. I, I would much prefer uh, to challenge the status quo and do better for our students. Um, and I believe in, in order to properly serve the students, the teachers and the administrators, we've got to get to a point to where uh, politics, everything like that is put aside and, and we create an atmosphere of transparency, openness, and collaboration. And we, we need to get to the point to where we're seeking um, compromise, not, not victory. It, it just seems, you know, there's been a lot of polarizing topics that comes down to us versus them and that just further divides our district and our community and we've got to work together to come up with better solutions thanks thank you michael ben picard thank you um what i'm hoping that the takeaway regarding me and my candidacy uh tonight is that i'm a man with a, a plan and no joke it's right here and i'll um, just kind of punch through um, what I'd like to do to help the kids in the district. Regarding student achievement, um, I'd like to set a goal of 85% of our students testing and proficient in reading and math by 2020. Currently, we're at 73% across the board weighted average. Um, teachers' compensation, I'd like to raise teachers' wages 10% across the board over 10 years to really put us on parity with Mount Pleasant and Atamwa. District enrollment, at this point, our population's increasing, and I'd like to increase enrollment by that increase, plus 1% each year, and that's around 30 kids in uh, 2018 magnet tracks. So I'm a proponent of two public elementary magnet tracks and one middle school magnet, as in Cedar Rapids, that's doing very well. Distance learning, I'd like to pilot and syndicate one new distance learning program per year through 2022. 
we need a Trojan Pride rebrand. Uh, we need to modernize our 40-year-old logo and our websites and our signage, apparel, facilities, and unify the look and feel. College job and job readiness, uh, let's go for a 99% graduation rate. Currently, we're at 97.5, which sounds high, but it's below the state average. Um, an 80% college admissions rate, and right now we're at 63%. Then a choice of the SAT or ACT, and really open an SAT track to enhance our college admissions rate. Regarding classroom technology, let's limit the use in K through 8th and then amplify it in 9th through 12th via full tech immersion track and then bullying and safety. Absolute zero tolerance on bullying. And we need to add a right. tab to our website to Thank report much, incidents ben. to the school board. And uh, with that, that concludes tonight's forum. I want to thank the candidates for participating. I want to thank our timekeepers, Joshua Larrabee and Dietra Detman. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the Chamber, FIDA, the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, and its staff for hosting us this evening. Um, as a reminder, election day is Tuesday, October 7th. Uh, the winner will complete the final two years of Phil Miller's term. Early voting is already underway at the courthouse, and polls on election day will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And with that, I bid you a good night and have a safe journey home.